I participated in one of these webinars, so um, I'm, uh, feel, I feel like I'm flying, flying a little bit blind. Um, anyway, um, I'll start now. Uh, what, um, what I want to talk about is an aspect of information for health, um, and as the subtitle says there, with a focus on the roles of the international classification of diseases. Um, it's a, a thing that I'm um, rather involved in in a number of ways. I might mention a couple of those as I go through the presentation. But it did occur to me that it makes, uh, makes for not a bad um, sort of a connecting theme for a presentation on uh, information for health. So let's see how we go. Um, now, I should just say that I'm uh, not quite sure how I um, uh, become aware of anybody. All right, I'll just proceed then. Okay, so um, I'm not sure how, uh, it, how well you'll see this, uh, this uh, map here. Um, it's, so this is in the context of um, health information. I'm going back to the middle of the 19th century. Um, this is a map from um, one, of the, one of the major um, investigations that John Snow conducted during the cholera outbreak in the summer of 1854. This is, this is uh, an image from his, um, his uh, write-up of the work that involved the um, famous and somewhat apocryphal story concerning the, the deactivation of the Broad Street pump. Uh, the reason I'm showing it now is not so much to do with the um, with that aspect of what he may or may not have done in in, um, in in the course of responding to that to that outbreak, but it's really um, to focus on how he got the information or some of the information that enabled him to do the work. Uh, in this um, most famous um, uh, of his of his um, uh, projects, but also in the um, and perhaps more importantly in the work that he did. Um, in um, uh, south of the uh, of the Thames, um, in, in in what he called his um, uh, grand experiment, in which he uh, looked at the relationship between which of two commercial suppliers was providing uh, drinking water to um, dwellings, and the likelihood of um, people living in that in that that dwelling uh, having uh, uh, come down with cholera, died of cholera. Um, in this, in the map that we're looking at here, it's an area of London north of the Thames, uh, and the, the black marks at various points on the street, as you can see in the expanded box to the right, are sets of parallel lines. Each parallel line represents one death, the death of one person who lived at that uh, that at, at a particular location in the, in a street um, during the cholera outbreak of uh, summer summer of 1854. Now where uh, where did uh, John Snow get this information about uh, uh, causes of death, uh, numbers of deaths, and, and their causes? Well, he got that from um, from uh, what was then still a fairly new information system that um, uh, uh, William Farr and others had developed in the over the, the, the two decades uh, leading up to 1854, um, which had these key properties. These are the uh, what I'm describing here is the key properties of health information in its first important era. Uh, there were three components to the systems that were put in place at that stage. One was the universal registration of deaths. The second was the systematic coding of causes of deaths. And the third was the, um, uh, the, the obtaining of reliable population estimates, not just size of population, but where people lived and demographic characteristics, particularly age and sex. And what uh, what Farr and uh, William Farr and his colleagues and, and people such as John Snow had discovered was that the use of these three uh, components of information in particular ways um, could really uh, in, bring a, a new sort of information and very powerful information to bear on public health problems, on health is issues in in, in in many in many respects of health in, health problems. Here's a picture of Farr and uh, a reproduction of the. Uh, first of his annual reports um, to Parliament um, when he just began, began the, the system that had the characteristics that I just described in 1839. Um, and I've highlighted there um, a few words from that um, first uh, report of William Farr to the Registrar General. Um, so he was he's talking there of, of using information on mortality, quantitative analysis of mortality, looking at things like sex and age group and and uh, various potential risk factors and the factors related to, to locality and time and date and, and, and other characteristics. Um, 
in our terms, what he's talking about there is epidemiology, uh, the study of the occurrence and distribution of health-related states or events in specified populations, and looking at the determinants of such, such states, and more particularly applying um, the, the, the knowledge gained from that to the control of health problems. Uh, and it was this latter aspect of the, of, of the use of this information that I think really marks Farr and some of his colleagues uh, in, in that era um, as, um, as effective public health physicians. Um, uh, Lilienfeld uh, wrote in an appreciation of Farr to mark the um, 200th anniversary of his birth. That 200th anniversary was in uh, 2007. Farr, uh, Lilienfeld wrote, um, it was Farr who developed the first national vital statistics system and assured its use as a surveillance instrument. He began the compilation of vital statistics data on an annual basis, including the analysis of causes of death and assessments of mortality by occupation and, and, other, and other characteristics. <coughs> Some examples of the sorts of things that Barr and his colleagues used this, uh, this the system that I'm calling the era one of, of health information systems. <coughs> Some of the sorts of things they used it for were to examine mining deaths, under, getting to understand why uh, mortality risks were very much uh, greater and different in, let's say, coal mining compared with other sorts of mining. Uh, looking at suicide, um, demographics and means of suicide, and uh, the use, effective use of this information, or this use of this information to um, effectively challenge what was a, an essentially data-free assertion, assertion from another investigator at the time, Brooke. Um, assertion that suicide death rates uh, rose with educational attainment. Uh, Far showed they did not. Um, perhaps most powerfully, uh, Far used this system to um, reveal differences between areas in health-related phenomena such as infant mortality rates and, uh, and posed the challenge to, um, to government, why should rates anywhere be permitted to be higher than the, than the lowest observed rates? So this then is um, what I would describe as, as um, era one of, uh, of the system, of, of health information systems. Um, excuse me. Um, universal registration is a, is a, of deaths is a key component. I should just say that um, it wasn't only deaths that began to be universally registered at this time. It was also um, births and marriages. Uh, marriages might seem um, not not such an obvious um, phenomenon to, um, to, to, to want to register if one was setting out with, to, to build a health information system. And indeed, it probably is not. And in fact, the, 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 what, what the government, and particularly the House of Lords at the time, thought that they were funding to be um, established was not a health information system, but a system to help manage the uh, transmission of property between generations. Um, this, this system was really seen predominantly and funded predominantly as, a, as in order to um, support, um, as I say, to support the, as, a, as an aid to the, 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 um, the tidier transmission of property from one generation to another. But it was people such as Far who were involved in its establishment who saw its enormous potential as a health information system. Um, the uh, so universal registration allows evidence-based statements about community generally. Um, the, um, the coding and classification of deaths, I'll return further to this uh, later, but what I'll say now is that FAR developed a, a classified list of causes based in part on an earlier uh, list and applied it to all deaths in England and, England and, Ma England and Wales. Um, it, by the time that he provided the data to Snow that underlay the map that I showed earlier, um, uh, FAR was already actively involved with colleagues um, mainly from other parts of Europe, but also from North America, in work towards the c converting uh, the, the, the national cause of death systems, coding systems, such as the one that FAR had developed, into, a, into a, an international standard system. Uh, in 1853, FAR accepted the invitation of, of the first uh, health statistics conference um, uh, that he, along with a colleague, Mark Despine from Geneva, uh, they were both invited, accepted an invitation to develop um, a, a draft international classification of causes of death. At the next conference in 1855, uh, the two versions that the, the versions that, that the two of them submitted were discussed, and a sort of composite was formed, basically using FAR's, um, uh, FAR's conceptual framework and, um, and, and categories from, from both of them. And this 
uh, international classification um, actually did, did quite well for a first go. It, um, it was revised uh, four or five times up until the mid-1880s and it became used quite widely in, um, in, in uh, several European countries and, and sub-national regions and in some states of, um, uh, of North America and indeed uh, throughout um, parts of the, the then British Empire including the, um, the, the, uh, the colonies that uh, later became Australia and New Zealand. I'll come back later to um, uh, what I would see as some of the more recent, uh, the, the, the new eras of, of health information, but I'll just give a, a, an overview of those leading on from what I've described as era one, and the implication being that I think there are other eras. Here's a sort of a, a summary, a pricey of what I'd see as the, as, as the, the um, subsequent eras. I don't think really there was very much fundamental change in the in, in health information systems uh, between what far of these colleagues developed in the second half of the 19th century and the middle part of the 20th century. I'd say the next fundamental change is being the development of electronic computerised databases um, in mainly in the 1960s in developed countries. So in Australia, for example, uh, cause of death data are in electronic unit record form beginning from, the, uh, from, from those registered in 1964. Um, the, um, uh, the, the, the technology um, was that, that allowed that electronic uh, develop, the development of electronic databases was introduced quite quickly by agencies such as um, national statistics agencies. It took some time before the added power that one can get as an analyst and reporter of data from electronic unit record data became widely understood. That had to await the wide dissemination of both the software and the hardware and the familiarity of of, of um, epidemiologists and others to really begin using that data in a, in a, in a strong way. Nevertheless, I think the era dates from the 1960s. Um, I think that another fundamentally different era um, it can be dated to the roughly the, 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 the mid-1990s to the middle of the first decade of, of this century. That's the era in which electronic communication of information basically became digital. At the beginning of that decade, uh, there's a credible estimate of, that only a few percent of, 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 um, of, of information transmitted was in digital form. By the end of that decade, nearly all of it was. Um, and what I'd point to as, a, as a, a fourth era, which is beginning about now, I think, and I'll take, speak about this just briefly later on, is, is an era in which the systems themselves, uh, rather than being essentially descriptive, are starting to become uh, smart systems in, in, uh, in, in, certain, in, in certain ways. But I'll come back to that later. Going back, though, to the sort of model that uh, Farr and his colleagues developed in the middle of the 19th century, which spread fairly widely in the second half of that century. How far has it spread now? Well, this is a chart from um, the United Nations Statistics Division uh, summarising, as of a couple of years ago, their best appreciation of the spread of vital registration of causes of death um, uh, throughout the world at that stage. Uh, I think it's, uh, well, it's certainly, there's a lot of green on that, um, on that, uh, on, on that map, which is good news. I, th I think it's, it's important to note that there's a, a quite a lot of white countries, uh, countries marked in white as, as implying that essentially no uh, systematic vital registration information available and some in pale shades of grey, particularly through central sub-Saharan Africa, um, uh, implying uh, quite low proportions of, 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 of deaths being vitally registered. And even where vital registration is done, there's a question about its quality. If, um, if cause of death coding is done in a way such that um, nearly all the deaths, deaths are coded to one or two dump categories, um, it's really not much better than having no information at all. And so uh, there's, a, there's a quantity and a quality issue as well. Nevertheless, there has been um, progression in the, in, the, in the spread of uh, vital registration. Um, uh, though there's, um, there's really a very long way to go still. And uh, globally, it's probably on the order of certainly still under a half of deaths that are that occur that would be um, uh, cause coded uh, with good quality and not that much more than half that are uh, cause coded um, at all. So what can one do with um, information that's, uh, that's in, in, in which one has uh, 
that, that can be derived from the sorts of uh, era one uh, health information systems that I've been talking about. Well, here's a, a, just an example of one of the sorts of things that one could do. Uh, what we're looking at here is uh, the results of just over a century of more or less consistent um, uh, re recording and coding of uh, causes of death information uh, for Australia. Um, I've just summarised it in terms of some broad blocks of types of conditions, circulatory neoplasms, external causes, and all causes up there in the top left-hand corner. Um, and one in, in this century, you know, for the first time in the 20th, for, for the first time ever, one can look at a, at a, a century in a, in a whole country and get a sense of, of, some, of some of the big picture things that um, have been occurring in terms of, of, of causes of death. Uh, the rise and fall of the circulatory disease, the cardiovascular disease epidemic of the middle of the of the 20th century, and uh, neoplasms, particularly the male the male uh, neoplasms, mainly mainly driven by smoking habit. And there's other things that one could see if if one uh, subsetted the data in in other ways, uh, in particularly the area of injury and external causes that I uh, is in the area area that I work in. The valid validity of this sort of what we're doing here is we're, we're essentially asserting that it's meaningful to compare um, estimates of mortality by cause and sex and uh, period of, of, of death here. And for that um, assertion to be valid, uh, we, we really that depends on um, the comparability of the data of, of the underlying data. But, and sort of to unpack that const, uh, construct, it implies that there's um, comparability of data collection where all the deaths registered in, all, in each of the years would be a question. Um, comparability in terms of cause assignment. Um, a, a, a question there would be whether doctors and coroners conceptualised, identified and recorded uh, information about causes reasonably consistently, at least for these broad categories that we're looking at. But it also implies uh, adequate consistency, in consistency of classification. The question there being whether the uh, versions of the International classification of diseases that underlay that underlies this this grouping of, of causes of death, whether the versions used at various times um, had comparable categories. So there's these sort of technical issues that underlie um, the, 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 the the assumption uh, that one might like to make that the um, that it is valid to compare uh, these um, th these summary measures over quite a long period of time. Another way of looking at the uh, at the underpinnings of, of the system that enables a picture like the last one to be drawn is institutional. Um, this diagram comes from a, a, an ABS publication and is um, intended to summarise the um, the way that cause of death information is, is gathered and, and, and organised in Australia. Um, I um, don't, I'm not intending to go through that in detail, I'll, I'll point to a couple of features of it in the next couple of slides. But the first point that one could get from just glancing at that diagram is that it's quite a complex system. And part, in part it's complex because Australia's a federation and cap with a federal and, 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 juris, and state and territory levels. And in part it's complex because different subgroups of deaths are, are um, information flows in, from various sources and flows in different ways. And it's complex for other reasons as well. Um, it's also worth noting that there is no single agency or organisation in Australia that has responsibility for the whole of this system. It's a, it's different bits of this system are the responsibility of entirely different governments and entirely different agencies within uh, those different governments. Um, just a, a couple of uh, features that I'll point out here. First of all, the, um, uh, the great majority of deaths uh, about um, 88% of them are certified by a doctor, uh, and about half of um, those deaths, uh, half of all deaths, in fact, um, occur in a, in a, in a hospital. Um, the, um, uh, the, the medical practitioners who, who um, record uh, causes of death do so generally by using a, a standard uh, cause of death form that I'm sure that everybody on this call uh, will have seen. That form follows a, a prescription of the World Health Organization and is designed as well, and it's, it's standard as part of the process of trying to ensure that the information gathered on causes of death is, is comparable. Uh, doctors are permitted to, comp to certify certain deaths, um, or to, to certify deaths provided that certain conditions are met, chief among them being that the, um, that the person, that the doctor has, that knows the person and has treated them recently 
um, and that the doctor is aware of no uh, no reason to be surprised at the death, um, uh, whether it's just the fact the fact that the deaths occurred or uh, the, uh, the, the apparent cause of the death, and that the doctor sees no reason to suspect that um, uh, violence or foul play uh, accounted for the death. Rules concerning uh, which deaths must be referred uh, can be certified by a, a doctor differ somewhat between uh, jurisdictions in Australia, but are largely along the lines I've just outlined. The remaining 12% of deaths in Australia are certified by a coroner. By default, all deaths need to be uh, referred to a coroner, and it's only the ones that meet the criteria that I've just been describing that are permitted to be certified by a medical practitioner. Um, as I said, rules d d differ a little bit about which ones doctors can certify, and implicitly then also there's some difference from jurisdiction to jurisdiction concerning which deaths are required to be certified by a um, coroner. In summary, those, in summary, though, they are mainly those that occur suddenly or in an unexpected way, and in coroner's jargon, are unnatural deaths, which includes suicides, homicides, and deaths that might be suicide or homicide, but it's difficult to tell. In addition, there are those deaths that people who are found deceased and don't meet the requirements that would allow a, a medical practitioner to, to feel able to certify them. Moving on now from um, cause of death data to another aspect of um, health information, hospital data. Um, the, the, the case records on which we depend for, for health information derived from hospital data are largely written by health, protect, health professionals, not only but particularly including uh, uh, doctors. The, um, the, the source of uh, the type of um, health information that's, um, that's most widely um, used statistically and, and, and as a form of health information is, inf is information derived from the uh, discharge summaries um, following episodes of inpatient. Uh, inpatient hospital care. There is also information of other sorts from emergency departments and one or two other sectors of the health system, but the hospital uh, inpatient data collection is, is fundamental, longest standing and most widely used. It's used for a variety of reasons, some of which I'll come to shortly. Um, the process there is, um, is, is very much focused on uh, state and territory uh, systems. Um, uh, the, 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 the public hospitals in each state and territory are uh, are, are required to provide health summar summary discharge information to the health departments in that jurisdiction. There are also some obligations that are imposed on, on private hospitals. They operate somewhat differently and somewhat uh, less formally. Um, then there are certain Commonwealth agencies that have, and, and agreements have been put in place between the states and territories in the Commonwealth uh, to, for the summer, national compilation and summarisation and reporting of certain uh, health information systems. Again, most particularly and for the longest period, uh, hospital inpatient data, but also to some, ex to some extent and more recently emergency department data and some other information. And at the national level, this, this collection is used in a variety of ways for uh, descriptive epidemiology and so on, but most particularly as, as um, underlying resource planning for the um, the, the, the mechanisms for dealing out the billions that go to, um, to, to paying for hospital services depend fundamentally on information that comes from this, uh, from this source. I've mentioned in passing um, that uh, cause of death, that the death data are cause coded and hospital data are cause coded. And um, in Australia and most other countries, um, it's broadly speaking the same classification system that's used to classify the causes of deaths and the causes of uh, hospitalised cases. In both cases, in both instances, it's versions of a thing called the International Classification of Diseases. I'll talk more about that shortly. Uh, but at, at this stage, what I want to point out is that uh, because both deaths and uh, hospital cases and some other uh, sorts of data uh, have been cause coded in much the same way. That's made it uh, easier than it would otherwise be to come up with things like the diagram in the, uh, in, towards the left side of this slide. This, this is a, um, a figure derived from uh, a version of, of the Burden of Disease and Injury Project that was done in, in Australia. It's not the most recent one. Um, I should have updated this with a with a figure from a, a version that was published just a couple of a few months ago, earlier this year. This gives the picture that I wanted to, to describe anyway. Um, 
you, you may be familiar with the global burden of diseases method. If you're not, I think you should be. Um, I don't have time to go into it in detail now, but I'll just briefly describe uh, some characteristics of it uh, and, uh, and how uh, it relies um, on ICT uh, coded uh, cause coding of, of, of both deaths and hospital data. Uh, the, um, uh, the, the unit you'll see across the um, horizontal axis of that figure, maybe it's too small to read, but anyway, is DALYS, D-A-L-Y-S, Disability Adjusted Life Year. This is a metric which its proponents would argue um, is, can allow a, a valid um, summing of and comparison of two aspects of uh, the burden of, of um, ill health that um, results from various kinds of conditions and, um, and, and burdens various subsets of the population and so on. These two aspects being the fatal and the non-fatal aspects. Uh, in, in very brief terms, the way that the global burden of diseases method um, sets out to do that is that uh, it identifies deaths that are attributable to uh, each particular cause and then notes the age at which each of those deaths occurred and uses a method to decide uh, how many years of life that might otherwise have been lived um, were lost due to that death which occurred at whatever age it did occur. And in essence, that's the basis of the blue parts of each of the bars that we've looked at there. So that um, uh, cardiovascular diseases, the second top um, bar there, you can see the blue bar is much wider than the uh, brown coloured bar, um, saying that, that that, and that's a way of asserting, um, as the global burden of diseases method does, that, uh, that the impact of cardiovascular diseases on, on, on health and well-being is predominantly through shortening of lives, um, uh, cancers even more so. Uh, uh, in contrast, uh, some of the other conditions down that list there, such as uh, diabetes, uh, the, uh, the the, the shortening of life, the mortality, according to this global burden of diseases method, uh, accounts for only a minority of the burden. The brown bar is meant to represent the other part of the burden, namely the, um, uh, the, that that's due to periods lived by people in suboptimal states of health because of a particular disease. Um, the, the method for calculating this component of the, of, of the DALI, the so-called years lived with disability or YLD component is considerably more complex and in some ways more uh, contentious than the method for calculating the YLL or years of life lost component um, shown in blue. In very broad summary, the way that the YLD component is calculated is to assess the uh, prevalence of each condition of interest in, um, in, in, the pop in a population of interest. Um, you see a diagram there of prevalence of diagnosed diabetes, just as an example. Um, and the prevalence needs to be, uh, prevalence estimates need to be by age group and sex and year. Um, and then uh, assessment is done for, for each of the conditions of the likelihood of recovery occurring and when, how long the, the condition may last before recovery occurs. For many conditions, there's no expectation of recovery, in which case the period, period of interest is what the remaining expectancy of life is um, following uh, the, the onset of, of the, the prevalent condition for each individual, for, each, uh, for, for uh, the various individuals in the population with the prevalent condition. Um, and the third main component that's used in, in calculation of the YLD component is a weight, which the um, uh, GBD, Global Burden of Diseases method, comes up with for each of the, uh, the, the, the conditions of interest and which is asserted to, and which, which is simply a number on a scale of naught to one and is asserted to, um, to provide an indication of how disabling each of the health states is that the global burden of diseases um, method uh, 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 it provides estimates for. And so if one, so that one, some, some conditions um, such as high spinal cord, you know, neck level spinal cord injury um, are, according to that weighting scheme, uh, have very high uh, dis disabling characteristics. One year lived with, with such a condition is, according to the GBD method, not very different from a year of life, life lost in terms of the number of dallies that it contributes. 
on the other hand, one year of living with a condition that, ha that is deemed according to that waiting scheme to be much less disabling, perhaps uh, one year of living with um, short-sightedness or something like that um, is, has a very small weight and uh, multiplying a, a period of a year by that very small weight comes up with a, a, a number of dallies which is very small, very much uh, less than the equivalent of a year of life lost. Uh, totting up all of those uh, various uh, summed quantities that take account of prevalence and duration, expected duration of living with a state of disability and multiplying by the weights that I've just talked about and summing the, the, the results of all those is, is the, the method that underlies the, the brown bars there. Um, it's an elaborate system, it's a complex system, it's the sort of system that, um, that um, uh, as I say, is, is somewhat contentious. Nevertheless, the point of showing it here is really because it distills, it brings together at, at a high level and in terms of uh, elaborate and sophisticated modern public health information methods, something that still depends fundamentally on the era one kind of information systems that I talked about earlier. The information underlying this, this system and that permits it to happen is in the main cause of ICD coded cause of death data and ICD coded hospital uh, inpatient data. There are other things in as well, but those are the fundamental ingredients. Move now um, to uh, talk a little bit more directly about the, um, the international classification of diseases that I, that I was just mentioning. Um, it, 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 it is, as I said, the its name is the International Classification of Diseases. That's its name now. Uh, back in the uh, 19th century and indeed for the first half of the 20th century, it has other, other names. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the system uh, that we have now has been administered by the World Health Organization since uh, just after the Second World War. Uh, in the first half of the century, it was administered uh, mainly by uh, an international statistics institute and uh, with some involvement of the League of Nations uh, in the 1930s. The, uh, the, the current uh, revision is, is the 10th and the 11th revision is in preparation. And I'll uh, end by speaking briefly about that. Um, and as I've said previously, it's the usual classification of cause of death coding and there's a URL there that you can uh, follow if you want to find out more about it. The uh, earlier I, I mentioned, well, I mentioned here, its origins in the 19th century. Um, the, the, the work that, uh, that William Farr and others did in the mid 19th century was remained the current leading method until the, um, uh, the 1880s. In the early uh, 1890s, it was seen as necessary to come up with a new system or a substantially revised system. Perhaps that's not surprising if one recognises that in the decade or so before that time, um, the whole understanding of the causes of, of communicable diseases had transferred, transformed. The germ theory was still brand new and, and, and emerging at that time. Um, given the large proportion of deaths at that time that were due to communicable diseases, you can imagine that suddenly having this radically new understanding of etiology of the, probably the leading cause of death at the, at the time did prompt people to think that it might be time to uh, review the classification system. Uh, the, at, at the time in the early 1990s, uh, a, 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 a conference invited um, uh, one of the one of the members, a French uh, member of the of the of the of the of the international community of of, of uh, injury statisticians, uh, to draft a, um, a a new classification. It was considered um, at several other conferences, most markedly, most uh, notably, including a classification, a, a meeting of the uh, P Public Health Association in Chicago, um, and. Uh, in the uh, years of the middle part of the 19th century, uh, it became accepted as this thing known as the Bétillon list, uh, became widely accepted as, uh, as the best available system and quite quickly became uh, used in a number of North, Amer uh, North America, uh, US states and countries of Europe and so on. Uh, it, became, it began to be 
a, a, a routine system for revising it was introduced. The French government funded the, the first uh, revision in 1900, and roughly speaking, each decade after that, it was revised again in 1910, 20, 29, 38, 48, 55, 65, 75, and 1989. Uh, first of those three uh, revisions were under the leadership of, of um, Vatillon, who was the author of the first version, um, and uh, one or two somewhat uh, fraught revisions uh, in the 1920s and 30s. And then uh, beginning with the uh, first version uh, administered by the World Health Organization, uh, it, um, the, the system began to be, um, uh, become much more similar to, the, to what we see now and, the, and, the, and, and began to be known as the uh, International Classification of Diseases. The, um, the use of the system was predominantly for causes of death, um, and it still is globally predominantly for causes of death. But its, its authors and developers also saw from early on the potential of the system to be used for, for morbidity, for coding of, of, of um, hospital cases and, and other things. It's, it was much less widely used for that until uh, the 1950s, and particularly the 60s and 70s, when it began to be used more, uh, more widely for that purpose. Um, here's um, a, a list of the chapter titles for the current 10th revision of the, of the ICD. Um, just to give you a sense of it, here's an, an example of, a, of, a, of a, a category from several of the chapters. Uh, cholera, um, still there, it's the first, cat, the first um, uh, category in the first chapter of the classification, perhaps reflecting still the prominence that communicable diseases and things like cholera had when this classification system began in the 19th century. Uh, also, there are other categories, things like um, uh, chronic diseases, congestive heart disease, uh, external causes of mortality and morbidity, all involving a bed, and also for some factors that um, are not per se diseases, but are characteristics, things that matter, particularly in the context of morbidity coding. Um, you know, there's an example of dependence on enabling machines or devices. Many of these categories have sub have subcategories that give that allow uh, more specificity. The clinical modifications of the ICD uh, began to develop in the 1970s. Um, I said that the mortality that the ICD had been mainly used for mortality until that time, uh, and the World Health Organization only developed one version of the IC, of each revision of the ICD. Um, as I say, that was one that had mortality coding principally in mind. As people began to use the ICD for uh, other purposes, for morbidity coding, it became apparent that, that there were certain sorts of things that, um, that, that you'd like to code for morbidity purposes that ha didn't have categories in the uh, standard cause of death coding version of ICD. So, versions were developed that typically just had breakdowns, five more specific categories for certain sorts of conditions that were seen as being uh, useful for uh, morbidity purposes and for costing purposes. Uh, the first of the clinical modifications is, was the North American one that was developed in the 1970s. Um, Australia's had its own clinical modification of, IC, of ICD, first ICD-9 and then ICD-10 uh, since the middle or late 1990s. Um, and, uh, and, and several other countries, about 10 other countries, have had uh, their own national clinical modifications of ICD-10. Um, I mentioned at the bottom of that, uh, of this last slide, that um, even though uh, that the US modification, uh, 10th uh, clinical modification, uh, was written many years ago, back in the uh, uh, late 1990s, but only came uh, into use in uh, uh, October of last year, for a complex of, of political and co commercial reasons. Um, uh, but um, it, it, uh, the, 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 some of the reactions to that new version of ICD-10 um, are another way of giving you some insight into some of the sorts of things that um, ICD-10 uh, is uh, capable of coding. And you know, as a, as a classification of much that ails humankind, and maybe and things that may be important to understanding conditions and caring for people with them. Um, the ICD includes um, categories that with the right take can be seen um, as odd or amusing. So as I said, these are some of the um, 
uh, some of the uh, reactions that um, appeared um, soon after the introduction of the uh, tenth clinical revision of uh, the North American version of the ICD uh, last year. And just one final one. ICD-11 is in fact introducing a more sophisticated system to allow um, cluster coding, the formal clustering of categories um, that um, would allow us to more effectively code Sharknado if that um, seemed to be necessary. And there's a hashtag, if you want to go and find more of these, you can follow that hashtag. I think it's still active. So um, just to summarise then that that um, health information sources are a variety of types. I've spoken mostly about uh, vital registration of deaths and hospital case data. And both of those systems um, depend largely on information recorded by doctors. And they are also systems that, that, that depend largely on cause coding according to the uh, international classification of diseases. For that reason, it matters very much what doctors record. It, it matters a lot both for the future care of the individual patient and patient liability and that and so on. But um, of course, but, but also it matters a lot for, uh, it, for to enable information to be captured that, that allows for effective and efficient health system administration and allows for official statistics on, on death and hospital care and allows for the epidemiology of the sorts, uh, that, uh, some of which um, I've been uh, showing through examples as I've gone through this presentation. Just in, in passing, uh, that there is a, a resource from the Australian Bureau of Statistics on um, cause of death certification and how to do it properly. It's um, getting a bit dated now, but uh, nevertheless, it's still uh, worth knowing about. Just for the last couple of minutes of this presentation, I'd like to speak um, about uh, ICD for the future. ICD-10, as I've said, is the current version. ICD-11 is in preparation. I think it's fair to say in terms of the sorts of eras the era's construct that I've um, introduced earlier, that ICD-10 is an information tool from the pre-modern information era. It was developed about 1990, in fact, mainly developed in the late 1980s. And that was a decade too soon for it to really to be fundamentally a product of the modern information age. Why I'd call that the pre-modern era, era for electronic information is that even though electronic computers existed and many sorts of systems were, were computerised and things like cause of death registration had begun to be computerised and so on, um, it really was pre-modern in the sense that digital telecommunication of information had barely begun. Um, there's a, a rather nice paper from Science, um, I've got the, a summary reference at the bottom, um, dating from 2011, that, that comes up with an estimate that in uh, in, in 1990, less than 100, less than one percent of total world capacity of telecommunication was digital, which it rose rapidly to about half by 1997 and nearly all by 2007. There's been this tr dramatic transformation going on in that era, all of which postdates the, the, the development of um, ICD-10. All of the World Wide Web postdates it, anything online, commercial ISPs, widespread email, social networks. Smartphones, all of those things postdate the development of, of ICD 10. While ICD 10 has been modernised and exists in electronic form, its, its design uh, remains firmly rooted in the era in which it was made. So ICD 11 is being designed um, from the ground up um, for a, a digital uh, information era. It was mooted, its development was mooted in 2006 and it's been developed since then. Um, it, it was designed at the outset to, to be fundamentally a, a smart um, database um, uh, multi, designed for multilingual use and um, to be suitable for smart systems and for, in, for interfacing with electronic health, health records and to work with things like the nomenclature called SNOMED CT that uh, many of you might be familiar with. And it's designed to, to, be, to operate in, a, in, an era, in an era of pervasive electronic information. While one might at first uh, flush think that that sort of transformation of ICD-11 is most important for developed countries like Australia, with, um, with um, you know, that are also developed in, in terms of electronic information systems, I think it's at least as important for those countries in which it's been very difficult to get um, health information systems established. Because I think there's some features of, 
an electronic approach to um, ICD that will facilitate uh, countries that have, have for a century been found themselves unable to uh, really put in place the really quite expensive and laborious sorts of predominantly manual information, health information systems that countries like Australia have had. Um, these same countries, are, you know, these countries are the ones that are skipping the era of landlines and analog transmission, straight to wireless, straight to an era of wireless, and so on. And in, it's in that context that things like ICD 11s web, web accessible networking and online coding tools, and social media like uh, collaboration mechanisms may enable um, the roadblocks to be uh, to be passed. Here's a, a, a schematic diagram from a. a first uh, written by a colleague, James Enstone Hinkins from the Australian Bureau of Statistics, um, that is meant to sort of characterise that the way ICD-11 is conceived, that at its heart are these electronic in, in, an electronic information infrastructure that can be accessed um, in various ways from both low resource and high resource um, users. Um, and, it, and is designed to be capable of putting out more and less, to being used in more or less sophisticated ways with very, with more or less sophisticated outputs. So that in a low resource setting, um, some aspects of the electronic infrastructure may be used in relatively sim um, uh, s simple ways, um, producing simple outputs, but nevertheless, benefit the users benefiting from the fact that a single global um, investment has produced systems which can be accessed by anybody with internet access, accessed by anybody with internet uh, facilities. In contrast, a country like Australia might well um, opt to uh, use a more sophisticated version, still based on the same core facilities, the same core classification, and the same core online tools, um, and but may opt to use it in a more elaborate manner, involving things like uh, clustering of, of course codes and uh, data linkage, cap setting things up in a way that allows it's designed to allow data linkage and so on. ICD-11 uh, isn't yet finished, the main step still to come are some, uh, the finalisation of a version for testing, um, some international processes, most markedly one that was meeting the revision conference coming up, in, coming up in October of this year, and field testing and uh, ultimately implementation. You won't be seeing it any time soon, it's, not, it's, it's most unlikely to be implemented in systems before 2020, or probably more likely 2022, but it is on the way. And I think it's quite likely that some of its features will be sort of brought forward into late versions of ICD-10, so you may see some of these features sooner than ICD-11 itself. I'll just leave this last slide up. Um, it's a sort of a summary text stump, summary of what I've uh, intended to talk about during this presentation, and I'll leave it there. <laughs>